Hello and welcome to The Wire. Today we have Mr. Santosh Malhotra with us, who is going to be discussing the budget with us, okay? And because the budget was, was extremely important, especially that this is, is going to be an election year, and the Modi government has announced the big seven steps to the Amrit Kal. Now, as the dust is settling, you know, we are really understanding what's behind this budget. And my first question to you, sir, will be that what, how do you see the budget? Is it pro-people? Is it pro-government? Is it pro-corporations? What is the budget really doing? Well, it's always difficult to give it one title, one appellation, and one type of description. The, go the government is always uh, trying to cater to many constituencies. Um, but actually what it is, is that it is attempting to be pro-growth. We know perfectly well that in FY21, on account of a sudden imposition of a national lockdown, the Indian economy contracted by 6.6% compared to the world economy, which had contracted by 3.1%. And because that broke the momentum of an economy, which although it had slowed for nine quarters prior to COVID, it had at least been growing. So clearly, from a slowing economy to one which contracted and contracted very sharply, the economy had to uh, recover momentum. So what it, it, the economy has managed to do in FY22 and FY23 is rebound to just above the level which prevailed before 90, uh, you know, in uh, fiscal year 20. 2019-20. Now, in this situation, given that many other um, engines of growth, which we can come to in a minute, have not been firing, uh, the one engine of growth that the government has in its control, uh, which is capital expenditure, public investment, it ha the government has attempted to use that. Um, now, that's one big message that's coming out uh, from from this from this budget uh, from this budget speech, and also from the numbers. But I think a little bit more detailed dis analysis of this capital expenditure also should be done, and I can come to that. Uh, if you wish, in a minute. So that's my first take on it. See, I think I'll just uh, draw your attention to Russia. Yeah, but the more important issue with the capital expenditure and respect to the budget is the following. <clears throat> that uh, last year, the government had attempted to do the same thing by uh, increasing capital expenditure. Uh, and it had allocated something of the order of about 7.6 lakh crores for FY22-23. Um, for infrastructure, for cap, for capex, not just infrastructure, for capex generally, it managed to spend about 50,000 crores less than that last year. Uh, which is not so surprising. It does often happen that, you know, uh, projects are not necessarily all in, in full readiness for them to begin to absorb funds, but be that as it may. So the allocation of 7.6 lakh crores or so, in actual fact, um, it turned out to be about 7.2 lakh crores. Now, this year, the government has allocated 10 lakh crores. <clears throat> Now, given that fact that the previous year the government managed to spend only 7.28 lakh crores, for it to have now allocated 10 lakh crores seems a bit of a um, overkill. 
because the fear is that it may it, it it's unlikely to be able to absorb all of it again <sighs> which might not be such a bad thing because what i'm reading is also that the government's not allocated enough for its own revenue expenditures and therefore when there is less absorption uh in actual capex creation i mean actual capex uh, expenditure then uh, it will get diverted to revenue but you see this inflated number of 10 lakh crores is itself slightly misleading um for the following reason uh the the reason is that over the years we've seen the government has actually um pulled you know taken every bit of advantage of the owner of its ownership of psus of public sector undertakings and uh, taken out significant amount, amounts uh, as dividend from them and therefore the the uh, psus have not been able to undertake capital investment which the government is saying it is going to do mm -hmm. uh okay if if the government is going to do that we have to recognize that there is a difference uh between the two types uh because what the government does is to is to spend on infrastructure public sector undertakings given that they are corporates which are functioning as particular sector or space mm -hmm. they will undertake you know expansion of capacity mm -hmm. so it's a it's a different type of capex mm -hmm. if the government undertakes it from what the psu would do so this is one issue the second issue is that um capex is capex whether psus do it or the government does it the point is if the psus are going to do less because they have less money left over mm -hmm. with them uh and if the government is doing more it swings and roundabouts we are pretty much at the same level as the economy would have in, or the government would have in, invested psus plus the the government in capex so that's the other dimension okay mm -hmm. so it's so the projecting it as a massive increase in capex is one is one thing when the reality is somewhat slight somewhat different this is another dimension having said all this i think one thing that needs to be recognized about the capex is the following that is planned for the budget <clears throat> like last year the government has offered uh loans to state governments who are willing to take it for undertaking capex mm -hmm. now again there are two dimensions to this which 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 of qualitative nature which need to be kept in mind the first is two or three dimensions the first is historically the states un have undertaken more of the public investment than the center has unfortunately because of covid increases in uh, covid related expenditure and all the relief that they have had to undertake meaning the responsibility has been with state governments they have had less left over for capex mm -hmm. so the government had last year allocated 1 lakh crores by way of loans pra mm -hmm. practically interest free loans interest free loans to be in to be repayable in about 50 years to be used specifically for capex um this year the government's increased that allocation to 1.3 lakh crores now there is one reason and all this by the way is included in that 10 lakh crore allocation that i was told, telling you about mm -hmm. um the good thing about you know getting the states to 
you know, pitch in, do more of the more of the capex, is that states undertake smaller scale projects, which are less capital intensive than what the central government does. The central government does, you know, you know, railway projects, um, highway projects, all of which tend to be relatively capital intensive and hence don't generate jobs. The economy has not been generating jobs, which is a very important reason that uh, for FY21, FY22, FY23, consumption expenditure has been low, meaning private final consumption expenditure has mm -hmm. been low and tepid. And that's a problem. That's a real problem, obviously. Uh, that's not surprising given that, you know, joblessness has increased. So consumption is low. We can come back to that. Sure. Uh, that is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still remaining on the subject of CapEx for the follow for the very important reason that, as I began by saying, this is an engine of growth in a situation that private investment is not picking up. And if you, uh, let me just make a quick aside about the private investment not picking up. Uh, it's, if you look at the first advanced estimates of the, of the Central Statistical Organization of the GDP for 22-23, and we must remember that this is just the first advanced estimates, and we also uh, know that there will be three more estimates of the by the CSO of uh, GDP before all this is finalized. The important point is that investment as a proportion of GDP, if you look at current uh, current estimates, meaning on the basis of current expend, um, current prices, it is. Um, it's only 29% after having fallen to about 26-27%. Mm -hmm. This government had inherited a, an investment rate of 31% in 13-14, which has only come, you know, consistently down uh, slowly over the over the years, uh, over the uh, nine years, uh, and now uh, it is in this budget increase somewhat to 29%. That's still very low for, an, for a poor country, which is attempting to grow fast. And we all, we all know that, I mean, the trajectory of our growth has actually see, seriously come down compared to the 2004 to 14 period of 8%. But so, so let me go back to the issue of- No, no, Cap I'll just like to interject budget, here, sir. CapEx and the budget, huh? You sir, know, sir, just, just I'm you... finishing. Yeah, sure, please. No, so I'm this just is finishing. To... The capex, the capex mm -hmm. budget in the of the state governments is much more important. We gen, we need to increase capex, no question, uh, because you know private final consumption expenditure is not increasing, and it's a good thing that the states are doing it. Sorry, back to you, Indrashekar. See, I have two points here. Of course, first, first to do with you know with the current budget. Do you think it can tackle problems, real-time problems of individuals, such as high inflation, food price inflation, and unemployment? Do you think that the budget is no. helping counter no. those problems? I, I mean, honest, no, unfortunately not. Uh, this is, of course... And why? What would be your reasons? Why is it not doing that? Well, um, because... Uh, because the... Problems of the economy are much bigger than the budget is even capable of handling. And, you know, with all due respect to the to the government's policymakers, that you and I might agree that unemployment is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government doesn't seem to think so. The government keeps making the claim consistently and all the apologists of the government, whether it was the previous chief economic advisor, uh, whether it was uh, the present chief economic advisor in the economic survey, whether it was the pre the previous ex India's executive director to the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Surjit Bhalla, 
they all keep telling you look at the plfs it's generating a lot of jobs the economy is generating a lot of jobs and i can talk you know i can this uh, speak to that subject but i i know and you know that the economy is not generating jobs and the plfs data is is misleading and i can explain that i mean but then then we will start talking about you know why the plfs data is misleading then you know we, this will not be about about budget i'm sorry so if you i don't know what what oh, we want sure. to speak then i'll just speak about. I'll add another and uh, the final thing about uh, the about inflation, inflation i mean the the one thing that the government ca- could have done regardless whether you were announcing a budget or not is to you know reduce the the taxes and excise duties on and cesses on petrol and diesel that's a hugely inflationary um, mm-hmm. uh thing that the government has been doing uh, consistently over the last 2 years and we we know why that that is happening because it has reduced personal income taxes it has reduced the corporate taxes in the last 3 or, or, or so years so it's now you know making up for it in a in a year if in which the economy is in crisis sorry i, I mean we are now sort of wandering in different directions so i'm going to uh, ask you to ask your what, whatever question you want no, sure. to ask no no sir sure. we 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 at the wire we appreciate conversations wherever they go and uh, so so just coming back to the inflation bit see although we may not we may not agree we do not have the government numbers but we do have the numbers of the dollar the rising dollar the rising petrol prices the rising imports and the indian economy in the eye of the world now this brings me to your private investment comment which you made earlier now given that the us fed is increasing rates aggressively even at the end of january we saw another 0.25% increase in the us fed if this number reaches another 0.5 or another 0.25 do you think the private investments in india are going to erode or increase what do you think well we know we know that uh, the fed is likely to you no know, raise rates again, again a bit um because inflation is uh, t- tapering uh, at least in the united states now we know that as a result of that it's p- perfectly possible that the rbi may be expected to raise rates again though my suspicion is that there is enough division within the mpc the monetary policy committee mm-hmm. to prevent that from happening it may well be that the the members of the mpc especially the independent members tilt towards uh, main, maintaining the current rate of interest uh, because there were already two members last time which didn't want to raise rates now um you you raised a, a good question and this is a good question for the following reason also let's just remember that private investment is not picking up mm-hmm. for two sets of reasons one capacity utilization still is only at 73 74% and until capacity utilization goes up to somewhere close to 80% the private investment investors and their that cycle investment cycle does not resume that's one reason the other reason we've already been talking about which is that private final consumption expenditure is still tepid and it is tepid because joblessness is still very high very high and the employment rate is low and it has been falling uh and and so you know there's a very little likelihood that the animal spirits of private investors are suddenly going to perk up and they will increase investment so 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 that's the other problem do you think that the budget is prepared uh, you know to tackle a global recession uh uh i mean look the government has other instruments for tackling a global recession the budget uh unfortunately has not has done some things for msmes to generate jobs the global recession uh, you know there it's still not yet a certainty that there will be a global recession 
because if you look at us us economy um, performance in the second half of 22 the us economy had already picked up it had performed better but on the other hand we know that the ukraine war is not going away the economic sanctions are still there uh, you know international crude oil prices are still quite high so it could go either way uh, in respect of a recession you know i mean there's been of course slowing of growth of course there's been growing jo- uh, unemployment in in europe and north america but we are still not certain the commentators are still not certain whether the international recession the, inter- the international economy is moving towards a recession so let's not presume that there will be one having said that we also we know that we are in a phase of the of of a deglobalization of the world economy trade to gdp ratios are coming down um, and in case the ukraine war continues then the prospects of a you of a international recession increase in which case the third engine of india's growth which is exports is not going to not going to be firing It, india's exports have already uh you know tapered off in the second half of last year mm-hmm. and and let's just remember that they had only just begun to pick up from their five year fall from 2014 on onwards they had only just begun to pick up and the fact that exports have not been growing but because of the rebound in the economy imports have increased which is the which is an important reason why our trade balance with china hugely increased to to over 100 billion dollars this is these are the factors which are showing up in a rising current account deficit which is likely to be in in the next financial year even higher mm-hmm. now if if you and and one important reason why the current account deficit is so high is because our exports are not growing any longer so uh, we've just talked about it. the third engine of growth is not is also not firing you know these uh, so in other words private investments not firing exports is not fry, firing uh private fine consumption expenditure is tepid what does the government have left as a in its armory the only thing it has left in its army is capex and we've just been talking about that so uh, you know all the issues uh, associated with capex so um so you can see you know where my understanding of where the economy stands in relation to uh in relation uh, and and the budget what its capacity for you know uh enabling uh, the engines of growth to fire i i'm not i mean in the budget you got some increases in uh, sorry some decreases in import duties in tariffs mm-hmm. in in a few products uh this might be the beginning of a reversal of the of a trend which we have seen with this government which where wherein about 3000 products where uh, import duties have been raised uh you know in, under under the garb of uh, the atmanirbhar bharat etc uh so here is a government which doesn't seriously have an industrial policy because i don't be- believe that the performance linked incentive scheme is an industrial policy uh, it's it's just a vertical scheme which has um, you know a scheme for vert for for of of, of vertical support by vertical i mean sectoral support for specific se- uh, industries which has been assigned to about 10 or so ministries which are supposed to manage the like in a in a government which doesn't seriously have a you know explicit horizontal industrial policy for across uh, across sectors across the whole industry uh you have a situation where 
we are our current account deficit is increasing because most of our imports are um, uh, you know machines chemicals and and so on uh, and and the, the budget did attempt to fix uh, some tax uh, you know the inverted duty structure in in respect of a few products but that doesn't constitute a full scale effort to support india's exports uh, and by the way in this i should add that the pli is not founded upon uh, the principle or the goal of increasing india's exports it mm -hmm. is simply an attempt to import substitute but you know import substitute substitution is fine but it will take some years for it to happen but you when you are asking for but new Mr. firms to come in yeah go see, ahead see see nehru did that indira gandhi tried to do that and you lived through those periods you know it's the make in india scheme it's not a new scheme it's a rebranded scheme which was which, which was a nehruvian idea which was an indira gandhian idea now it's a modian idea okay no no and, hold on hold on hold on let me explain self sufficiency make in make in india make sorry no 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 i need to sort of clarify this i think this is a this is mistaken notion make in india mm -hmm. was no scheme there were only two dimensions to make in india one was ease of doing business mm -hmm. improve the ease of doing business second was come make in india meaning mm -hmm. encourage fdi so yes mm -hmm. increase fdi has increased but fdi has increased in absolute terms but our economy has grown also the point is fdi contributes no more and the best case scenario you know never contributes more than 7 or 8% of total private investment in the whole economy if if the whole economy is private investment i'm not talking about government capex if mm -hmm. the whole economy is private investment is about let us say 30% of gdp you know this contributes no more than 2% of gdp please try and keep this in mind so make in india is nothing like mm -hmm. then import substitution under nehru or mrs gandhi i'll tell you what what is like you know mrs gandhi the pli is like that the the pli is like that because it is intended to be import substituting without thinking about the you know export potential there are many other schemes which are i mean sorry there are many other dimensions of about pli which are pro highly problematic and we should we can talk about them but you know sure. I different think that will, uh, that, yeah, yeah, it will be a different subject altogether. So, so you, what, what I mean, let me, you know, finish with the, the, the important point, the summary point. The summary point is that our current account deficit has risen, and our export and the budget doesn't do very much for exports. This is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, so I think this is again a slight different tangent. but from everything that you've described you know the exports are not working private investment is not at its best position you know we every day we read in the newspapers the foreign uh, forex increasing decreasing increasing it's is fluctuating every time you know there is also this market stock markets crashing the other thing is that the and the, these are the other counter facts that we have you know the the gold prices are highest ever you know which which usually signal that people are losing faith in the market faith in the economy and are and are putting money elsewhere you know you look at silver prices you look at commodity prices so this is also a good indicator right. and you and you back this up with you rightly said the russia war the russia ukraine war and the fed the us fed increasing rates aggressively and will continue to do so in this in this current year the final point to that is that the us economy here the us federal reserve has artificially pumped trillions of dollars to boost the markets in america whenever that bubble bursts which can happen this year which can happen in the next 6 months or tomorrow you know what is the overall implication of that on the indian budget and the indian economy you know we have to also keep the counter measures and counter data in mind when we are talking about the global recession so any comments on that okay um i'm not a great admirer of this government's uh, economic policy management over the last 8 uh, to 9 years Uh, I think we've seen evidence of uh, poor economic policy management uh, ever since, particularly the exogenous, exogenous shock 
inflicted upon the Indian economy in the form of the uh, demonetization, which has very severely impacted uh, the MSMEs. And our capacity to uh, withstand another international recession, which is what I'm taking away from your question, has been weakened over a period of time, uh, precisely because, as I was saying, our private investment has has been tepid. Mm -hmm. And if that private investment doesn't pick up, uh, then our expectations of sustained growth of over 7% per annum, mm -hmm. which is what we need to achieve if we plan to become, as we are constantly reminded, we will become uh, a $5 trillion economy by FY27. Well, we need to grow at at least 7% per annum consistently for that to happen. We are only $3.2 billion just now, and we may, we may not even get to that by 27. We, we will get to that if we grow at 7%, but by 2030 and 31. So the what am I saying here? I'm saying that we are the poorest country among the G20 countries. Our per capita income is $2,200. We are the only low middle income country among the G20 countries. In terms of per capita income, we are at a rank of 147 in the world. Okay, out of a list of 180 plus countries, we might be the fifth largest economy, but in per capita income terms, we are, our rank is 147. Most people don't even know or recognize this. What do we need to do? If we want to reduce poverty, we have no choice but to grow at more than 7% per annum. And we, and, and all the, uh, signals, all the signs are that we are not doing enough to grow at 7% per annum on a consistent basis without volatility, without going up and down in growth rate. And given that the rebound is complete, and I think we should bring this discussion to a close now, because given that the rebound from the contraction of the, of the economy during the pandemic is now complete, the and at the same time, the four engines of growth are not firing enough. We are unlikely to achieve even six percent next year. We we might have managed to achieve seven this year and eight point seven in the previous year. But this, as I keep repeating, is a rebound from the contraction of FY twenty one and COVID. So it's very unlikely that given all the the signals that I think we've talked about during this discussion with you, the likelihood of our economy even getting to six next year, 6% 6 growth is very limited. It's more, it's more likely that it will be well below six. So then where is the goal of even a $5 trillion economy? So just the last question. When will we know? achieve that? Yeah. So last question. So if you talk about the social schemes, you know, even schemes like the Magnerega, schemes the, like the PM Kisan, we find that there is a huge budget cut. What do you think about that? The, although the Modi government is talking about building infrastructure, what about the people scheme? You know, some, uh, some of the schemes that the poorest and the most underprivileged people of this country deserve. How is that going right. to figure out? Right, right. So first let's... Uh... Let's accept the fact that even in FY23, the government had allocated less for Mandrega and it had to increase it because it's a, in the middle of the year because it is a demand driven scheme. And this year it has allocated, you're right, it has allocated 60,000 crores. Almost certainly, if for the reasons that we've been discussing, uh, you know. 53 million people have been added to agriculture be between the years 2020 and 2021. 
so there is very serious rural distress because such a large number of people jo- rejoined agriculture in those two years um the demand for mandrega is ex- still extremely high well above the monthly rate m- monthly rate of person days demanded uh the, m- well above the 2019 20 level that means the pre pandemic level therefore the, there will have to be an increase in allocations for mandrega so let's just get that uh, clearly out of the way but over the course of the year by the time you know an increase in allocation takes place there will still be friction within mandrega friction by friction i mean the following uh, already we know we have evidence that wages are not getting paid under mandrega so people who are quite desperate for work are working but they are not getting paid so the, you know there are months of delays in 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 getting wages this is a problem uh on other welfare schemes in the budget there's been an increase for uh, jal jeevan mission from 55000 crores to 70000 crores uh this has been a government commitment so clearly the you know in a pre election year the government is going to uh you know make sure that this gets spent um similarly um in um uh there's one other um where there has been some increase uh, um uh, this is sort of uh, the education mission the national education mission has seen an increase from about 32.6 uh, 1000 crores to 38.9 nearly nearly 39 1000 crores so in respect of you know mandrega there's been a reduction uh but in but in, res- in these there has been an increase the increase i think however the more important point is the following as far as social welfare is concerned i don't believe that the allocation to agriculture is enough let me explain uh, what the allocations are in the budget the allocation in fy 22 23 was um was uh, let me see what is it 77000 sorry well i um, i'm looking at 77000 crores i'm talking about agriculture alone i'm not okay. talking about including pm kisan pm kisan I think has got the same amount this year as it had. It no, got reduced. Last year. PM Kisan is also reduced this year. Okay, sorry for the sorry for that. But I, you know, okay, I understand. Um, I mean, we'll have to do a separate show on PM Kisan. There are really very serious problems with the design of PM Kisan, but I don't think we should be. The point is, it might have been reduced. But I'm here speaking specifically about non-PM Kisan agriculture. Sure. non pm kisan agriculture fy23 the allocation was and and uh, re expenditure was 77000 crores this year the allocation is 84 84000 crores that's a 10% increase however i find this seriously inadequate for the following reason not just because you know mandrega amount is is still low i just told you something which you know should have really shocked you and which should shock your readers that my estimate of of the number of people now suddenly uh, dependent upon agriculture mm-hmm. has shot up from 188 million in 2019 20 uh, 2018 19 to a whopping 233 million in on account of the reverse migrations of 2020 and of 21 if if anyone thinks that in uh 2021 you know people were leaving uh, people were leaving their rural homes to go back to their jobs in urban areas in the rest of the country some of that did happen but it didn't happen anywhere close to what people you know people might believe there was still an 8 million increase in those dependent upon agriculture in fy 22 meaning in 21 22 now what is the implication of this a 55 54 million increase in the numbers dependent upon agriculture the share of agriculture and total employment rising from 40% in 
in 1920 to 46 percent in 21-22, sorry, 2021, is a is a unbearable burden upon rural areas and agriculture because that leads to real wages declining, which is why poverty is likely to have increased in rural areas. Under such circumstances, the agriculture needed a boost. Agriculture investment needed a boost. Agriculture uh, uh, public investment needed to boost because you need to increase productivity in agriculture. Under these circumstances, the allocation of a mere increase of 10% when the inflation rate has been running at over 6% in any case, in real terms, it's a mere increase of about 4% in agriculture. This is the problem. In other words, Precisely the sectors which are suffering, mm -hmm. which have taken a hit, they are not getting the support that they desperately need. This is the point I'm, I'm making. Uh, and, and I think we should, with this, um, bring this to a close. So thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, we would love to have you again and discuss more aspects of agriculture and economy. Viewers, if you have any more questions, please do, don't forget to type uh, your comments on our YouTube channel and comment on our Twitter page. So keep watching The Wire. We'll have more analysis and more shows for you shortly. Thank you very much. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.